Hello everyone. So, so far we have uh, discussed the different aspects of nuclear chemistry, including the fundamentals of radioactive activity, nuclear structure, nuclear models, different types of decays, detection of different types of radiations, and also nuclear reaction mechanisms, different types of nuclear reactions, including fission and fusion. And in the nuclear fission and fusion, we discussed about how to tap the energy from the nuclei to produce electricity and that for the fusion our efforts are going on. So today we will now switch over to another aspect of nuclear science and technology that is their applications of the radioisotopes in different areas. So we will not go into details of applications. but how to produce the radioisotopes for applications in many, many areas. So, radioisotope applications is one area of nuclear science and technology. Nuclear fission and fusion is another area. So, we will now discuss the production of radioisotopes, which are useful in many, many applications. So, I have just given in a nutshell what are the different ways by which we can produce the radioisotopes. So, mainly we have at our disposal, the reactors or other types of neutron sources. So, we can irradiate a target material with neutrons to produce radioisotopes or can have accelerators, cyclotrons, electrons, Van de Graaff, etc., wherein we bombard the target by charged particle, again produce radioisotopes. Using neutron radiation, when we irradiate the stable targets, we get neutron rich products which are invariably beta minus active or we can suppose we irradiate the actinides, the fissionable materials then by nuclear fission of these heavy actinide elements uh, we can produce fission products which are also many of them are useful in different areas. In charged particle we irradiate the stable target materials and since we are bombarding with charged particles we, we produce neutron deficient radioisotopes which will be emitting plus electron capture and light. So, this in nutshell gives you different ways by which we can produce radioisotopes. So, now we will first discuss the neutron based radioisotope production where there are different processes, different ways by which we can produce radioisotopes. Okay. So, we will now discuss using neutrons what are the different ways by which we can produce radioisotopes. The first and the most common is by N gamma reaction. So, you all know that if you irradiate a target material, let us say Z by N gamma, then we get A plus 1 X Z. And this invariably is the minus active. So, we get A plus 1 Y Z plus 1. So this is how we can, in fact, increase the atomic number of a target material by generating neutron and then the neutron induced reaction product is beta minus X. So, this is the most common route of radioisotope production in a reactor or it can be even other source like you can have photon neutron source or you have a GT neutron source, you can have even a californium 52 fission source of neutrons, but the most common source of neutrons for radioactive production is a nuclear reactor where you can at the same time radiate several targets and produce large amount of activity that we discussed in the nuclear reactions. So we have the what, what I have listed out is the isotopes which are very much used in some area or other. So cobalt 59 N gamma gives you cobalt 60 having a half life of 5.27 four years which is undergoing beta minus and this cobalt 60 then after beta minus lands up in the excited states of nickel 60 and which gives you two beautiful gamma rays 1172 and 1332. These are the gamma ray because of this gamma ray the cobalt 60 finds lot of applications in 
irradiation of materials, many applications you will find industrial irradiation based on gamma and so on. The cross sections are also given here in this column. Cross sections are very important. To get higher activity, we need to have higher cross sections. So, cross sections are given in bonds. One bond is 10 to the minus 24 centimeter square. So, cobalt 60 is used in many industries like radiography or food irradiation. Many types of applications you will find cobalt 60 is used as a source. This is, this is a gamma source. Then we have molybdenum 99 by natural molybdenum 98 and gamma reaction. You can also produce uh, molybdenum 99 by other routes which we will discuss later on. It has got a low cross section 0.14 bond, half life is 66 hours. It is a parent of the 99M magnesium, which is 6 hour half life, and that is used in nuclear medicine diagnosis. So, again, sodium 23 and gamma sodium 24. Sodium 24 is a hard gamma emitter, which emits high gamma, high energy gamma rays, and having a half life of 15 hours, it, can, it is used as a tracer in many, many applications. Iridium-192 produced by 191 iridium N gamma is another isotope having 73 days half-life and cross section is quite good. So iridium actually emits different energies in hundreds of kV and for radiograph radiography it is used very commonly in industrial radiography of many products like non-destructive testing of equipment we use. So cobalt 60 and iridium are used. If you want to do radiography of a heavy, heavy material, heavy machine tool, go for high energy gamma ray, cobalt 60. If it is a small one, you, you want a low energy gamma ray source, you use iridium 190. 197 gold gives you N gamma 198 gold, 2.695 date, cross section is also quite good. And 198 is used as a regular in many applications in industry. Bromine uh, 81 N gamma, bromine 82, you can even prepare a gaseous uh, product, radioisotope tracer or ethyl bromide, so a liquid tracer. So, if you want to trace the path of a liquid or a gas, you can use bromine 82 tracer. So, this 35 hours in industry, bromine 82 has a lot of applications when you want to trace the path of particular like a petrochemical. If there is a leak of a petrochemical in a long industry, you know, in the underground pipeline is going on. If you want to know where the leakage is there, you use this bromine to as a tracer and you can trace where the leakage is there. So these are the you know different ways by which N gamma way by which you can produce different isotopes. And one important aspect of this is that you irradiate the target material the radioisotope also is of the same element and so the bulk of the material remains the same elements and therefore they are not carrier free means all the isotopes are all the atoms are not of radioisotope but there is a bulk suppose you irradiate one gram of cobalt then only maybe picogram or nanogram or macrogram of cobalt will be converted into cobalt 60 bulk of it still remains the cobalt 59. So that is what is the meaning that it is not a carrier free. So there is a carrier always associated with the carrier with the stable target element. So this, this is the drawback of this uh, gamma route that you don't get a carrier free radioisotope. And carrier free means only the radioisotopes, other isotopes or, or stable isotopes are not available in that particular concern. Okay. The another uh, way is called the Szilard Chalmers reaction. So the you know, the necessity to produce carrier free radioisotope but using N gamma reaction you know, led to this kind of developments in the radioisotope production. So this can also be called as isotope enrichment by required chemistry. That means you you make you take such a compound that after the neutron ga N gamma reaction the radioisotope is detached from the compound and you have a carrier free radioisotope. So this is more of ideal way of speaking but we will see that you can increase the specific activity of the radioisotope consignment 
by using Szilard Chalmers. When I say specific activity means per gram of the target, how many, at, how, many activity, how many atoms are radioactive. So what is the activity per gram of target that is called the specific activity. So just to give you an example of Szilard Chalmers, Szilard and Chalmers actually developed this methodology of producing radioisotope. So for example, you want to get 82 bromine in the carrier free form. By bromine 81 and gamma, you will get bulk of the bromine remains 80, bromine 81. And so bromine 82 will be present in a large amount of bromine 81. But if you take an organic molecule like ethyl bromide, now bromine is bonded to ethyl group by a covalent bond. And when you have an N gamma reaction, then the one of the bromine atom will become bromine 82. And what happens that because of the recoil, when this N gamma reaction happens, a gamma ray that is going out of bromine 82, bromine 82 will be excited to 81 bromine N gamma bromine 82 and it is excited. So when it is emitting a gamma ray, this gamma ray will give a required bromine 82 and it will be snapped from the organic moiety. So you will have bromine 82 which is not bonded to ethyl group. So now you have bulk of the material remains ethyl bromide which has got different chemistry and the bromine 82 may become bromide ion and which will have a different chemistry. So you can separate bromine 82 from ethyl bromide and you will get 82 bromine 3. Similarly, potassium chromate, 50 chromate you irradiate with neutrons to get with 51 chromate. Now this chromate ion, you know, so you CrO4 2 minus, that CrO bonds may get broken when the gamma ray gives a recoil to chromium 51. And because of the breaking of this bond, you will see free chromium, which may stabilize at chromium 3 plus. And therefore, this has got different chemistry than the chromate ion, which is chromium 6. And that's how the, if the target and the radioisotope have different chemistry, then you can do separation, get carrier free radioisotope. So what is the concept behind the required chemistry? This is because the prompt gamma that is emitted from the excited nucleus by formed by N gamma reaction, then the, when the gamma ray gives a coil to the, new, uh, the atom, atom, then the linear momentum of the gamma photon, the momentum is conserved. So we can calculate what is that coil that the required atom will give, what energy the required atom will give, yeah? So the momentum is nothing but for gamma ray energy upon C, energy of the gamma ray photon and the velocity speed of light and that same will be the momentum of the required nucleus. So whatever is the momentum of the photon, the required nucleus will get that much momentum to conserve the momentum. So uh, if you see this is the momentum of the required, then the energy will be E squared upon 2m. So it will be E squared upon 2mc squared. So you can see here, if we have a 5 MeV gamma ray getting emitted from the compound nucleus. The 5 MeV gamma ray will give it a coil to see what is the value. So for bromine 82, the required energy will be 47 electron. You can see here, the prompt gamma ray of emitted from excited bromine 82 will give a required to this, let us say, this ethyl bromide. And then this, uh, rather than bromine 82 will give a kick, get a kick of uh, 47 EV and it, that, that, that will lead to the detachment of the bromine 82 from the and this this is per atom. So in terms of uh, no, chemical energy, kilojoule per mole, it corresponds to 4500 kilojoule per mole. You can see that typical bond energies are of the order of hundreds of kilojoule per mole. Where the required energy received by the bromine will be thousands of kilojoule per mole. So the net result of this required will be that since the required energy is more than the bond energy, the required atoms will get detached from the parent molecule and you will have now the reverse stop as an isolated atom and it will stabilize in its uh, most stable state. So like bromine will become bromide if it is an organic solution. So you will find that bromide, bromine will have different chemistry than methyl bromide. Similarly, the chromium will have different oxidation state than bromate. So you will have chromium 3 plus positive ion, the bromate ion. 
to minus ion. So then we can go for chemistry separate radioactive atoms from the stable target. In fact, a very interesting experiment we had done on such experiment was to get molybdenum 99. No, molybdenum 98 n gamma gives you molybdenum 99, and bulk of the molybdenum will be molybdenum natural molybdenum with molybdenum 98 is very small abundance. And so, if you irradiate molybdenum in a com organic complex to an organic molecule like it hydroxyquinoline, then this n gamma reaction will give that required to the molybdenum 99. And the 99 molybdenum detached from the organic complex will be at a different oxygen state. So you can actually do solvent extraction of this molybdenum hydroxyquinoline in chloroform, and molybdenum 99 will be left in the that question. So that is thereby, you know, you can detect, you can have, you can concentrate, or you can enrich molybdenum 99 in a equal solution. That is the bulk of the molybdenum 98 hydroxyquinoline will remain in the organic phase. That is how. The, you can increase the specific activity of a N gamma. Another way of producing the carrier free radioisotopes is N gamma followed by beta minus T. There, it is not always possible, but there are many examples where it is possible, and I will give you some examples of that. For example, tellurium 130 N gamma gives you tellurium 131. And which is also radioactive and undergoes beta minus decay to iodine 130. So, iodine 131 is the isotope of interest for iodide imaging because it is emitting 364 kV gamma ray. So, if you want to image the thyroid of a patient, you just give him sodium iodide solution. Iodine is having 131 iodine activity. So, if no, this, how do you get a carrier free iodine 131? You simply irradiate it from the Tellurium metal target and tellurium will give you iodine, which easily you can do radiochemical separation of iodine from the tellurium because they have totally different chemistry. So, this is this N gamma followed by beta minus decay. The, the, the N gamma product of tellurium is 131 tellurium, which is 25 minutes half life. You allow for this to decay. So, in about four half lives, they will decay to iodine and then you can do the iodine chemistry from the tellurium target. So, iodine 131 is actually widely used in treatment of thyroid disorders and typical specific activity of this iodine 131 you can calculate. Suppose you have all, now here there are no other atoms of iodine other than 131, so 100% carrier free. So, if you have one curie of 131 iodine, then you can calculate the number of atoms. So, you can see, so activity, activity equal to n gamma, so n equal to a upon lambda, not n gamma, n lambda. And so, so you, you know the half life, so you can substitute for the lambda in terms of the 0 0.693 upon t half, and this t half will go up, that's what I have done here. So, activity, and you will get the 0 0.693 into t half for 8 days. And then you can see Avogadro number will weigh 131 gram. So you can calculate in terms of number and convert to grams. So you, you can find that the activity, the specific activity of uh, iodine 131 generated in this tellurium irradiation will be about 1.24 to the power 5 lakhs. So lakhs of curie per gram. So very, very high specific activity because all atoms, all radioactive atoms are of 131. Iodine. There is no stable iodine that is 127 iodine, so which is not present there. So this is a these are the methods by which you can get carrier free into stops given by neutron reactions. Another example of this is lutetium 177 that is produced. You can produce lutetium 177 by 176 lutetium and gamma, but this lutetium will be having bulk of 176 and also you have 175 lutetium which is the dominant abundant acid. But here you will find that if you irradiate ytterbium, then ytterbium and gamma will give 177 ytterbium and which is undergoing beta minus decay to 177. So you can, though they are rare earths, adjacent rare earths, but you can still separate them by careful radiochemical separations and so you can have 
carrier free glutathione 177 6.78 which is used in treatment of neuroendocrine tumors basically for the diagnosis and therapy of the tumors in the glands so these are the examples of n gamma followed by beta minus dk production of radiovascular in the case of light z elements you know for lighter elements like you know low z carbon sulfur phosphorus chlorine so up to you can say mass number 40 50 or so where the barriers for the emission of charged particles are low so you can have np and alpha and alpha type of reactions so these reactions are possible only for the lighter targets because for heavier targets the emission of proton and alpha is hindered because of the high so you can irradiate like sulfur if you radiate sulfur compound sulfate sodium sulfate you will get phosphorus 32 and then phosphorus 32 the cross sections are given half life of phosphorus 32 and the mode of decay is there so phosphorus 32 is utilized in many applications given for the skin uh, skin catches for the treatment of skin cancer similarly you have cobalt 58 as a from nickel 58 np reaction it is a small cross section and you have the 70 day half life of cobalt 58 and it is emitting beta plus or an electron capture okay cobalt 58 is used as a tracer in many applications then you have night carbon 14 and sulfur 35 which are also used as radio tracers in organic chemistry you can use carbon 14 you can use in organic reactions sulfur 35 also sulfur 35 labeled compounds you can use in synthesis of organic compounds containing sulfur so for, for neutron induced reactions wherein the proton and alpha are emitted mostly involved in the lighter elements and certain isotopes are very useful so you go for these methods then with with the aluminium you have n alpha but that requires a fast a neutrons because they just have got threshold reaction so the q value is negative so thermal neutrons you will not do you require a higher energy neutrons energy more than a kev will call fast neutrons and so you want to produce sodium 24 see normally sodium 24 you can produce by sodium 20 through n gamma reaction but if you want carrier free sodium 24 you go for this route aluminum 27 n alpha sodium 24 15 hours apply and even with thermal neutrons you can produce tritium then lithium n6 n alpha you can have to get tritium and this tritium this in fact this route is used to produce tritium for strategic applications and for that matter you know even for normal applications you can use to want tritium for some applications so you can see here if you do this method and e and alpha type of reactions then by this method since then the target element and the radioastro produced have different chemistry they are different z value so you can you can do chemistry and then you have these isotopes are carriers. This is our the methods by which you can even use neutrons to produce carrier free radioisotopes. Then you have there are certain methods called multi stage neutron capture. Multi stage means after one neutron capture, whatever isotope is formed, it will continue to capture neutrons and you will get a much higher isotope of the same element or there can be beta. So successive neutron capture among this happens when yeah, the flux is very high so that the radioisotopes that, that are produced you can further capture neutrons to, to, to next isotope. So this in fact is happening you know, if you have a nuclear reactor, power reactor or such reactor to irradiate uranium. For example, if you have 238 uranium, you will get N gamma 239 uranium. This will further undergo beta minus decay. 239 neutronium, it will undergo beta minus to 239 plutonium. So, in the reactor, if you have bulk target is uranium, natural uranium is 99.3 percent, so you will have a continuous production of 239 plutonium. And this plutonium 239 has a half life of 24,000 years. It will capture neutron to get 240 plutonium, 240 is having half life 6,000 years. It will become capture another neutron to 41 plutonium and which is emitting beta minus to 241 americium. You can see all the isotopes have half lives in years. 
So if you want to produce americium 241, which is very, very useful in many applications, you, then you need to do. So in the reactor, you will find a lot of plutonium is being produced. About, you know, if, if you have a ton of uh, fuel, then about a kg of uh, plutonium will be formed. And this, this is still continuously capturing neutrons to form. And so, so you spend the fuel of a reactor, such reactor or power reactor will always have plutonium and americium. This is the way by multi multiple neutron capture. Similarly, in fact, the same the concept is used in producing tungsten 188. Tungsten 188 is a parent of rhenium 188. And 188 rhenium can also be produced by N gamma. But this is not carrier free, and you require for many applications uh, carrier free to stop. So you create a tungsten 186 by N gamma, you get tungsten 187 having half life of 23.7 hours. And you this can capture another neutron to get tungsten 188. This tungsten 188 will undergo then beta minus decay to rhenium 188. So this is like a generator system. 69 days half life of tungsten 188 going rise to rhenium. So you can have a system column containing tungsten 188 and you can milk rhenium 188. So this is the way whatever rhenium you will get will be carrier free. But this see this successive neutron captures since the half life is short, it requires a very high flux reactor. Otherwise, you know, the production rates may be much lower than the decay rate of this isotope. So, typically, 10 power 15 neutron per centimeter square per second is the flux required to produce this kind of isotopes. Of course, we have discussed nuclear fission in uh, previous lectures also. So, nuclear fission is a very, very rich source of beta minus radioactive isotopes. So, you already know that we radiate neutron, uranium with thermal neutrons, you get several pairs of fission products like one pair being 144 barium plus krypton 90 and this is the mass distribution as a function of mass number, the fission yield, fission yield maximum about 8%, minimum about 0 0.01 at symmetry, the lower yields are also there. So it is an asymmetric uh, mass distribution, so you will have a large number of fission products produced in fission and many of them are long lived and have a lot of applications. So normally the, the, the fission products have higher n by z compared to their stable isotopes and so most of them are beta minus active. So there is a chain of isobars wherein the beta decay takes place and you will have about 500 fission products that will be formed in the fission process. So, if you, if you can pick up the ones which find applications in many areas and then you can go for subsequently the radiochemical separation of individual isotopes used in different areas. Now, so this is the list of uh, radioisotopes that are produced in fission, long lived fission products. Krypton 85. So you can see here if you try to draw the mass yield curve A versus E typically about 8% and 0.01%. Now you can see typically this is around 95 and this is around 138. So that gives you an idea what will be the yield of 85. 85 will be somewhere here. And this is a gaseous radio tracer. So, suppose you want to do a tracer application wherein you want to see the leakage in a gas pipeline, you can use Krypton 85. It is having half life of 10 years. You can produce, you can also produce by Krypton 84 N gamma, but you know, radiating a gaseous target in the reactor. Instead of that, you can have a fission product. So, if you radiate the nuclear uranium and you can just do distillation of the fission product gaseous material very high yield technetium, krypton 85 can be produced. Strontium 90 is another isotope which is having very long half-life. So it is present in the radiative fuel and it is parent of yttrium 90, which is a 90 yttrium 
took 64 hours, so it, it, it in fact goes to 94, 96 yeah. and it is a generator system or produced in, in the fission products. Molybdenum 90 also can be produced in fission and you will have fission moly. In fact, there are plants which are available for producing molybdenum by fission route. 106 ruthenium is used in ocular cancer treatment, 131 iodine, the treatment of thyroid disorders, 140 barium as a tracer, and then 140 is used excellent tracer for sand silt movement, 144 cerium also for the tracer, and promethium 147 is a pure beta emitter and it is used in the luminescent paints. So there are many applications of radioisotopes and most of them are available in the spent fuel. So if you irradiate uranium, you get all of them and you can then do chemistry depending upon their half-lives, you can separate them and use them for different applications. Okay, so I will stop here and I will take up the other method of charged particle irradiation to radioisotopes in my next part. Thank you very much.